what we want to move into is a time where we can not just have an intellectual idea of what might this look like, but actually to receive in our own hearts an outpouring of the Holy Spirit to be fired up to actually accomplish this. And so we're going to have uh, Pete Barak come up, and, and Pete's a close friend of mine. We actually did communion prep together, went to grade school together, high school together, and then we got split up for a little bit. But I'm now a godfather for his oldest daughter, and I know Pete very well. Pete isn't just a man of intellect that he did. He graduated from Franciscan. He got his master's from Sacred Heart, but he's really a man of devotion, a man who's devoted to his ministry, and he works as the director for ID, which is the young adult ministry that comes through Renewal Ministries and is now actually the vice president of Renewal Ministries. But more than just a job, what I see in Pete is a heart for mission, a heart to see the world know and experience the love of Jesus. And so what I'm hoping for today is that we can simply open up our hearts, open up our minds to receive through his words a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that we too can recognize that we were made for mission and actually be sent out from this day to accomplish that mission together. Please welcome Pete Barak. Thanks, Father Jim. Love you, man. Love you too. All right, everybody stand up, please. I'm a former gym teacher, so we're going to roll out the dodgeballs. No, I'm kidding. Why, why, why don't we just do a little bit of this? You know, a little praise of Jesus, maybe do a little washing machine, Brian, put your hands on your hips, move around a little bit, get the blood flowing. Yep, everybody's got to do it. It's important. While you're standing, some of you are like, wow, it's one of those type of speakers. And yes, I am. Yes, I am. So look to the person next to you and say, it is good that you are here. Now turn to the person that you didn't choose for whatever reason. And say, Jesus loves you. you. Very good. Good, good, good. Two truths to start the talk. That's great. It's good that you're here and Jesus loves you. All right, that's enough. Sit down. That's enough of that. It's taking some of you quite a while to sit down. (laughs) That's pretty funny. On the way up here, I was driving up. So my wife and I, we live in Celine. And as I was driving up here, I was just... um, kind of reflecting on the, the uniqueness of this moment for me. So you see, I was, I was born in Ann Arbor. My parents met at the University of Michigan, and uh, we've been part of the Christ the King Parish for my entire life. And I was just kind of thinking about like all the incredible things that have happened in my life in the Diocese of Lansing. I met Jesus in the Diocese of Lansing. I fell in love with Jesus in the Diocese of Lansing. I was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit in the Diocese of Lansing. I was discipled in the Diocese of Lansing. I felt a call for mission in the Diocese of Lansing. And so I just, as I came up here, I just felt in my heart, in my spirit, just like an incredible, profound gratitude for the Diocese of Lansing. And um, yeah, you can clap for yourselves. That's good. And I just wanted to start by saying like, um, it's really easy when we're working for the church or working in the church or working next to the church or watching the church or whatever, uh, to, to notice all the things we'd love to change, isn't it? But I think one of the things that needs to change, <laughs> ironically, of what I just said, is I think we need to just embrace as part of this cultural change that the bishop's talking about, a culture of affirmation and a culture of celebration for when it works, You know, because guess what? The gospel still works. Jesus is still Lord. The Holy Spirit's still moving. Even this corrupt, confused, all over the place generation in the world that we live in still can be compelled, transformed, converted, and go to heaven. So it does work. And so we need to pay attention to that and remember that. And with everything we're talking about today, we're not talking about it just in the abstract of we hope it works. No, no, we need to shift it to we believe it works. Because if we don't believe it works, then don't do it. If you don't believe it works, if you don't believe the gospel is true, then what are we doing? So let's start with that. And as I was expressing my gratitude to the Lord and just kind of saying like, I love the Diocese of Lansing. I do. I felt like I said, Lord, could you just give me um, a scripture, kind of like a a prophetic scripture as a gift to these people today? And this is what he gave me. It's from Deuteronomy. 
If anyone had guessed Deuteronomy, you win, okay? <laughs> Deuteronomy 31. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in sight of all Israel. Maybe a better way to think about that for today is the Lord has summoned the bishop and said to him in the sight of the whole diocese, be strong and of good courage, for you shall go with this people into the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for you shall go with this people into the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them. What does that mean? The promised land is God's revelation of the thing he's already going to do. Like, when, when Israel comes up to the promised land, just that phrase alone is a prophetic phrase, the, the promised land. What they're looking at is something that already belongs to them. And what I felt like the Lord wanted to affirm in us is the promised land for us are the souls of the Diocese of Lansing. And I felt like the Lord wanted us to know that he's giving us these people. This promised land is right in front of us. And then he wants to remind us to be strong and of good courage. Why? Because it is the Lord who goes before us. And when the Lord goes before us, we cannot fail and we will not be forsaken. Okay? Can I get an amen? At least a little one. Yeah, all right. All right, good. That was actually better than I thought, Catholics. That was pretty good. <laughs> so um, when I was just, uh, just finished my junior year of, of college, my buddy Joe and I had this great idea. We said, why don't we go to Europe and basically go into seven countries in 12 days? Sounded pretty good. And we had two friends who were studying in Rome. Their names were Jim and Dan. And we thought it'd be really great if we could kind of end the trip with Jim and Dan. And so uh, we started in, in, in uh, London, and then we, we took a ferry across and went to Normandy. And, and this whole thing was basically as much planning as we had as we knew we were going to go from London to Rome. And we had peanut butter. And that was our lunch every day, peanut butter, right? So it was awesome. We, we did all these things, and it was kind of make it up as you go. And, and sometimes it worked really well, and sometimes not so much. And at one point, we heard about, in Austria, this, this place called Berkischgaden, which is uh, this town that was home to Hitler's, like, kind of last-ditch fortress thing up high in the mountains. And we thought, that'd be cool. Let's go there. So we got on a train, and we went to Berkischgaden. We got off the train, and we realized that, like, when they said on top of a mountain, it was indeed on top of the mountain. So they, we didn't have enough money to pay for the train, or I guess we could have, but we just decided we didn't want to. So we hiked up the mountain. One of the best parts about Europe is there's no guardrails anywhere. It's kind of like, and Europeans are like, if you fall off the mountain, that's on you, right? And so <laughs> we're, we're, we're going all over the place. And then because we're way up on this mountain, we see this lake out in the distance. And we go, wow, well, let's go there, you know? And then we look at our watch and we realize the one thing we had planned that day was we had to get on a train, an overnight train to Rome. So we're doing the math. It's like 15 kilometers. We had no idea what that meant. I was like, oh, my God. And that doesn't seem too bad, 15, right? And so we, we set off and we start to walk there. And we, we get there and we, we jump into this glacial lake and it's glorious and it's freezing. And it's amazing. And then we start to walk back and that was less fun. You know, the walk there was great. Not so much the back, the, the back road. And then by the time we get to the train station, you may have guessed it, uh, but we missed our train, right? And so now we're faced with this conundrum of like, well, do we spend the night in the train station? Do we just, what do we do? And uh, Joe said, well, let's just jump on a train. I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? They'll just kick us off. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, probably true, you know? And so we found another train that was going to Rome, and we got on it. And we got on it, and we didn't have seats, obviously. And so when the conductor came by, we actually hid in the bathroom together, one of those tiny little... So it's like us and our luggage, two guys in the bathroom, like, this is normal, this is good, don't worry about it. And so then once the conductor went by, we snuck out, and we found a train car. It was one of these that had a bench, two benches that faced each other, three seats on each side. The only two seats available were the two middle seats. All night train to Rome, 
Not ideal, but let's do it. So I sit in one, he sits in the other one, and we're just kind of sitting across from each other like this, and the two, you know, the four other Europeans are kind of looking at us like Americans, and I'm like, yeah, we are. You know, so we're looking at each other, and it's great. And about two o'clock in the morning, I'm miserable, right? Because the two people next to me, they're leaning up against the side. They look super comfortable, and I'm trying not to touch them, and it's just, I'm just so uncomfortable, and Joe's feeling the same way. And all of a sudden, at 2.30, 2.30, 3 o'clock, Joe just jumps out of his seat, hits the deck, and rolls under the bench. (laughs) And I'm like, son of a gun. Because I look down there, and sure enough, he's just like, perfectly content sleeping. He hit the legs of the people. They got a little annoyed, but he was, he, was, he was comfortable. He was good. And I'm like, all right, not a bad plan. So I'm kind of sizing up the height of the bench and the width of my body and trying to figure out, like, yeah, I, think, I think I can do this, but I'm, I'm a little dazed. It's late, late at night. And so I, I'm just like, I'm going for it. So I hit the ground and I roll and boom, bottom half, success. Top half is just stuck. And I'm just leaning out in the middle of this, the, the, and I'm just, I'm, I'm literally, I can't move. And the more I wiggle, the more I feel like I'm stuck. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, I'm losing feeling in the bottom half of my arms. I'm just like, ah. So I start, I say, Joe, Joe, wake up, Joe. And he's just sleeping like a baby. Joe, Joe, wake up. And finally, he's not doing anything. So I said, Joseph Patrick Falvey, wake up. And he, which startled him to know it. He sat up full straight, slammed his head into the bench, knocked him out. No joke. He literally knocked himself out. Boom. And just, he's out. And the rest of the people in the car stand up and they're freaking out because I just yelled in there. And this little old lady, babushka lady next to me, she had her purse and she gets up and she just starts hitting me with her purse. No joke. It was amazing. But the good news is because they got off the bench, it moved just a little bit. And I rolled back under there and slept the rest of the way to Rome. It was glorious. So, what does, that tell, what does that story tell us? I, I'm actually not sure, but no. Why, why did Joe and I want to do that? You know, why did we want to climb that mountain? Why did we want to go to that lake? Why did we want to steal aboard a train that we weren't supposed to be on? Why, why were we doing this at all? Because deep down in us, we were pursuing glory. We wanted something to be glorious. We wanted to have a story to tell. We wanted to kind of live with a little bit of risk, with a little bit of risk. And what I've come to realize from that trip and from lots of other things in my life is that everything worth doing, everything good, everything worth pursuing involves risk, involves a cost. I remember when I first started falling in love with my wife. Uh, we had just met at the Francis. I had transferred there, and I met her the second day I was there, and I was very intimidated by this beautiful brunette who was the, basketball, the point guard on the women's basketball team. And the second time I ever saw her, she had a big old black eye because she got elbowed during a game, and I thought it was, like, the most glorious thing I'd ever seen, you know? <laughs> and so I'm trying to figure out a way to, like, you know, spend more time with her, and I said, hey, because this was back when texting was just become, like, not expensive. You remember that? Or it was, like, really expensive when it first came out, and then it wasn't expensive anymore. And uh, I said, hey, can I text you? And she said, no, my parents won't pay for the texting, so I don't have texting. And I was like, you mean I have to, I have to call you? <laughs> I don't want to do that. You know? And I remember walking around campus praying that she would not answer the phone so that I could leave a message. You know? I was just like, oh, gosh. This, oh, oh. And I finally it went to voicemail. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. And I left a message, and then the rest is history. Right? What was the point of that? She was worth it, though, but there was a risk to it, wasn't there? There was a risk. There was a, there was a cost to me. I was, I was concerned about something. Everything worth doing carries a degree of risk. And the difference between a risk worth taking and a risk not worth taking is whether or not, and especially in the, in the Christian mindset, is whether or not the outcome of the risk is greater than more beautiful, more true than the risk itself. Risk for the sake of risk is foolishness. Risk for the sake of risk is foolishness. But risk for the sake of a calling, risk for the sake of a commissioning, risk for the sake of faithfulness is glorious. And if you don't believe me, look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God for the joy that was set before him. When you look at scripture, every great hero we set before us and we teach our children about in scripture had to deal with risk. Gideon, Moses, Joseph, David, right? All of them. Judith, she's a great one. If you don't know what I'm talking about with Judith, she's, she's intense. She's, she's a real one. Look her up. All these great heroes of the faith. And then you just go through the saints. Paul, Peter, the disciples, Francis Savior, all those cards that you have on the desk or on the table in front of you, all these people we hold up at some point had to realize that the calling that the Lord had put on their life carried risk. And they had to decide whether or not the calling and what it was leading to was worth the risk. Friends, you have to ask yourself that same question. Is the call of the gospel, is the call of discipleship, is the outcome of evangelization, is the salvation of souls worth it? Is it worth it? And to what level is it worth it for you? Not to what level it's worth it for the bishop, or for Father Dan, or for Father Steve. Or for the, you know, the guy who likes to play worship at the, the, the church or, or for your mom or for your grandma. No, what level of cost are you willing to sacrifice? Because guess what? Whether you like it or not, Jesus asks not for a little, not for a portion, not for what we're willing to give. Jesus asks for everything. He asks for it all. He actually has some pretty strong words about if you're not willing to lay it all down, you are not worthy for me, of me. And to pick up your cross and to follow him and to give your time, your talent, your treasure, everything you are, your dreams, your hopes, your identity, everything, and lay it down at the foot of the cross. And friends, quite honestly, like if we're not willing as a diocese and as leaders of the diocese to take that risk, to pay that cost, then I don't think the vision that we all would say we want, I don't think the outcome that we're, we're, we're pursuing is going to happen. Because fruitfulness requires faithfulness, and faithfulness requires obedience, and obedience requires a calling an ascent to that calling. Do you realize that every single example I gave had three things in common? First was they were called. They were called. And as the bishop has said over and over again, as the, as the popes have said over and over again, if you don't know you're called at this point, ah! <laughs> like seriously, you are called. But everyone the Lord calls, everyone the Lord commissions, he also equips. So the second thing that everyone in this the list that I talked about, everyone we've ever raised up as fruitful, second thing they have in common is they have been equipped. And the interesting thing is they're always equipped after the calling. And very often, kind of at the last minute. <laughs> kind of like the Lord is almost kind of like, yep, yep, keep following, keep following. And now you have what you need. Now you have what you need. I mean, Gideon has this incredible mission of, of you know, of this battle in front of him. And the Lord just keeps taking things from him. Nope, you don't need those guys. Nope, you don't need those guys. Nope, you don't. And now here's the plan. Now you go do it. So they have a call. They're, they're all called. They're all equipped. And then they're all faithful. They persevere. Because what the great heroes of the faith show us is not, it's not just enough to be called. It's not just enough to be equipped. But you have to persevere in that calling. You have to persevere in that equipping. You know, you could make an argument that it's taken us kind of maybe two generations to find ourselves in the place we are. You know, with, the, with our pew counts and all the different metrics that show us in decline, you could argue that there's, there's been a couple generations that this has happened with over, right? 
Well, maybe the Lord's plan is to use a couple more generations to get us back and to be even further down the road, to be even bigger than we ever were before. The Lord's timing is his timing. Our job is to persevere. So in order for the risk to be worth it, we have to be called, we have to know we're equipped, and we have to persevere in it. Okay. So, I'd like to share with you, switching gears slightly here, I'd like to share with you seven reasons why I think people don't evangelize. Seven reasons why people um, don't evangelize and don't kind of do the discipleship thing. And um, like any good millennial, when I was trying to craft what the reasons would be, I did an Instagram poll, which was incredibly enlightening, actually. People, even agnostics were answering for me. It was pretty wild. Like, I have a couple friends who have left the faith, and they're like, I don't evangelize because this, this, and this. And I was like, I think you don't evangelize because you don't believe. But that's a different story. (laughs) So here are my, my seven reasons why I don't think people engage in the mission. First one is this. We don't know we should. And again, not to like beat a dead horse, but that's the easiest one to debunk, okay? It's basically like, well, you are. (laughs) If you've been baptized, you have been called into mission. And again, if anybody wants to question that, that's scripture, that's the Second Vatican Council. That's just like, yeah, that's just it. Okay, so first one, we don't know we should. And we can laugh about that, but that is pretty alarming how often I run into people who really don't realize that it's... It's their job. And one way to think about it is mission as something that um, I have to go generate for myself. Like, the Lord needs me to go do mission. Yes, but a better way I like to think about it is the Lord needs me to join him in his mission. So instead of saying, when I go to my workplace, I have to figure out a way to create mission. No, I have to go to my workplace and say, what is God already doing here? I'm going to do it with him. Do you see how it changes? who's the the protagonist. It's not so much that I have to go into the workplace and figure out a way to drum up mission. I have to add another thing to my life. It's like, no, my life is a mission, and therefore everywhere I go, I'm I'm on the the lookout to say, what is the Holy Spirit already doing here? I can't wait to do it with him. Okay? So the first reason is we don't know we should. Second reason is we've never seen it work. And, And kind of along with that is we're afraid of failure. We've never seen it work. And what I mean by that is, um, who, wants to, who wants to join a loser, right? Like, who wants to do something that just never seems to ever produce anything? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of our Catholics are saying, like, yeah, I, I might be interested in sharing the gospel. I even maybe believe it, but I've just actually never seen somebody come to faith. Number three, we don't feel ready. We don't feel ready. We don't feel equipped. How many times you've heard that? Ah, I don't know what to say. It's like, so, I, you know, as soon as I read that next Scott Hahn book, then I'll be ready, you know? It's like, nothing wrong with Scott Hahn books. I'm all, I'm all in favor. It's like, oh, could you just put on a workshop? You know? Here's the thing about life. You're never ready to do the thing until you do it. If you've, anyone who's been married knows this very well right? You can take marriage prep. You can look at marriages. You can study marriages. You can think about marriage. You can do all the things, but then until you're married, you had no idea how to be married. (laughs) Same with the priest. You you go to seminary for an awfully long time, don't you? You do all sorts of different things, and and then basically as soon as you find yourself in a parish doing the priest thing, you're like, wow, I really didn't know what I was doing. (laughs) You know, I I I coach basketball with my, my girls, and I can demonstrate how to shoot a basketball. I can do all these things, and they have no idea how to shoot a basketball until they start to shoot the basketball. So the easy answer is, you're not ready? Yeah, join the club. But the only way you're going to get ready is by doing it. Okay, number four. We are worried about what others will say, what what they will do, and most importantly, who we will lose. People don't evangelize because they're afraid of losing. I think think it's a little overblown, the idea that we're going to lose our jobs or our money or, you know, that, that type of thing. Yeah, I think it's more a fear of losing relationships. Number five, we don't evangelize because we're afraid of being seen as hypocrites. Because if I share with somebody how I think they should live or how I think we all should live, especially those who know us really well, like our family members, they're just going to be like, yeah, but remember your senior year in high school? You know, 
or I've seen how you, you treat your children, or yada, 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 okay? We're afraid of looking like hypocrites. Number six, we often separate in our minds the need to build community and go on mission. One of the reasons we don't see evangelization and discipleship happening is because we've separated our minds that there's a thing called community and there's this thing we do that's mission. My favorite line from John Paul II, Christopher Dallas Lachey, section 32. He says this, communion and mission mutually imply and interpenetrate each other. So in other words, when you say communion, you're implying mission. And when you say mission, you're implying communion. And he says, communion gives rise to mission, and mission is accomplished in more communion. So out of us, we are sent to what end? To bring people back into us. You cannot have Catholic community without mission. And you can't have Catholic mission without community. They are two sides of a coin. And too often we try, we say, oh, we're going to build community and then at some point we'll get to mission. If you want to build community, go on mission. We take uh, young adults to Mexico City almost every year, and uh, we serve the poor in these garbage dumps outside the city. And we bring medical supplies and, and food and all this. And at the beginning of the week, the people who come with us are usually a relatively, mostly strangers. There's some relationships, but it's mostly strangers. By the end of the week, you would run through a brick wall for anybody on that trip. We've actually had marriages come out of that trip. Not on the trip, but like <laughs> people, yeah, you get it. At the beginning of the week, what united us was mission. Why are we here? How do we have to live? What's our life look like? Where, where do we eat? What's our roles? Who does what? We're united around mission to accomplish something. And what that produced is a people, a family. Okay? And then finally, Number seven, the reason we don't evangelize, and I think the most devastating, and the one that I, I pray, and I know we've ta we talked about this on the RRM committee a lot, the one that we just hope would erupt in this diocese, is number seven, is uh, we, don't believe, we don't believe it matters. At the deep down in our hearts, we don't believe that it actually matters whether or not somebody knows Jesus Christ. We kind of live with this therapeutic universalism, which is basically like, well, my neighbor's not Hitler, so he's probably okay. Or we live even a more damaging thought is like, I think my neighbor's a better person than me, and uh, he, he's not a Christian at all, so who am I to tell him how he should live? Why, why would Jesus, he's a really good guy. He's a really good guy. How many times have you heard that? He's a really good person. She's a really good person. That very well might be the case, that they're good people in some regard. But when I read Scripture, especially the Gospels, I see Jesus preoccupied with communicating to his disciples the absolute necessity of coming to the Father through him. The absolute reality that there is a heaven and there's a hell. And those are the two ultimate destinations. And it really matters what you do, what you believe, how you live, as to where you end up. Again, don't shoot the messenger. This is just, this is just the word of God. We started doing a Bible study, um, uh, Peter Herbeck, Ralph Martin, Joey McCoy and I. We read through the Gospel of Matthew, just looking for instances where Jesus talks about the conditions for salvation. Just the Gospel of Matthew either explicitly or implicitly, what does he say about salvation? Any guess at how many separate passages deal with this topic? 63 in the Gospel of Matthew alone. Jesus doesn't just like offhandedly mention this stuff. He repeats it and repeats it and tells it in direct language. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And then in, in parables, he, he talks about it in every conceivable way. Because he knows it's true. And why does he reveal this to us? Because it's mercy. The truth of this sets us free. 
It's a mercy and it's a love that is born in the people of God to actually run the risk of sharing the gospel with somebody because we care and we know that if they don't believe, they're in trouble. And of course, we don't stand in judgment to determine you're in trouble, like ultimate trouble and, you know, like, I saw what you did. Like, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. That's up to God. That's, I mean, that's above my pay grade, you know? All I know is that he tells his disciples that the road is wide and easy that leads to destruction, and the road is narrow and difficult that leads to life. And he shows this to us so that as many people as possible can find that narrow road. So one of the reasons I, th- I don't think we evangelize is because we don't actually believe that. It's the core of our soul. It doesn't burn in us. Okay, now, so that's the, <coughs> you could say the bad news, so to speak. Now, I want to give you now five ways we flip that script. All right, you ready? You still with me, ma'am? All right, she loves it. Yeah, that, a, that a girl. Are you in the first wave? Because if you're not, you should be. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's talk five things where we can start to flip that switch, okay? Because remember, everything I just said, the seven reasons I just gave, ultimately spring forth from a place of pride, where we put ourselves and say, I know better, I think this, I'm afraid of this, my reputation. We say we, pride gets in the way of this. And so remember, the risk is worth it. If you're called, you're called. If you're equipped, you either are equipped or you will be equipped. And through the power of the Holy Spirit burning in your heart, you will be equipped. And then we need to persevere. Okay? So tip number one. Embrace failure. Just, just let's get to the point where we recognize that people are going to say no. And that's just a reality. I remember when, uh, when we first started doing alphas at my house, we did uh, nine of them in my house, and it was great, and there, I have lots of different stories about that, but I was so fascinated by the whole alpha thing that I decided to go to, to London to see it for myself, to see where it came from. So I found myself in Holy Trinity Brompton Church, and uh, Nikki Gumbel, the, the pastor of, of, this, of this church, and the, basically the founder of alpha, is up in front, and he's giving his, you know, his talk or whatever. And then at one point he goes, okay, now we're going to celebrate invitation, and I'm like, okay, Protestants, like, what, what does that mean, you know? And then, um, I know, I, I have, don't, Father John, I'm, I'm working on it, okay? Anyway, so there's a line of people that come up, and he takes the mic, and he walks to the first one, and he goes, um, and I don't remember her name, he's like, how many people did you invite to the last Alpha? And she says, I invited 10 people. He's like, great, how many people came? And she's like, nine, and everyone goes, oh, golf clap. Next person, I invited 35 people. Great, how many people came? 21. And down the line, numbers getting bigger and bigger, right? And everybody kind of seems bored with it. I'm kind of like, this is interesting. And then the last person was this little old lady. And she's kind of hunched over like this. And Nikki goes, how many people did you invite to Alpha? And she goes, she took the mic from him, which was hilarious. And she goes, I invited everyone in my neighborhood. And a, a ripple goes through the crowd. Like, everyone in the neighborhood, how, could that, how many people is that, you know? And she's got this big smile on her face. And Nikki's like, and how many people came? And she goes... This huge smile on her face. She goes, nobody. <laughs> and the crowd went nuts. Ah! You know, and she's walking out the stage like, yeah, you know. <laughs> and me, red-blooded American male, is like, what? That, that, that lady failed at an epic level. What are you doing? So I, I, afterwards, I was like, I went up to one of the leaders. I was like, you got to explain this to me because this makes no sense to me. And he was like, well, listen, it's pretty simple. He goes, uh, inviting somebody to something is hard. It can be really challenging. There's a cost, there's a risk, right? And so what we celebrate in our church is the effort, the action of invitation, not the result of that invitation. Because that's on Jesus. That's on Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and that person. Our job is to invite, their job is to respond. And so what that broke in me was this idea that like, oh my gosh, it's not, it's not my job to convince. It's not my job to to get them over the hump. That's the Holy Spirit's job. My job is to do my part, and often that is an invitation. And too often we live in fear of, what, what if they say no? Well, if they say no, at least they responded. At least we brought them to a decision point. One of the major reasons we have lost so many people in our church is we don't bring them to decision points. I do a lot of work with young adults. The number one reason they've left the church is they've just kind of, meh. They've just kind of drifted out. They just kind of stopped going. Because nobody ever sat them down and said, do you believe this? 
Nobody ever brought them to a decision point. And you read the scriptures, Jesus is constantly bringing people to decision points, isn't he? He's constantly making people choose. And a lot of people say no. A lot of people walk away. Okay, so first one, embrace failure. Second one, we need to individually and equip people with our story. You need to know your story. You need to know what God has done in you. Not what God has done in your husband. Not what God has done in Bishop Oye. Not what God has done in St. Therese. You need to know what God has done in you. When the apostles are launched out after Pentecost and they go all over the world preaching the gospel, they all had the same basic message, didn't they? Jesus is Lord. Repent and believe in the gospel. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Join us. You know, they all had the same basic message. And the, the fancy word is kerygma, right? But everywhere they went, they didn't go, I know this is true because I saw it in Peter. They're like, I didn't, they don't say, I know this is true because St. Paul told me. They're like, no, I know this is true because God has done this in me. Jesus is the Lord of my life. I know what life was like before I met him, how I came to know him, and what life looks like now. The first letter of St. John, how does he start? He starts with this. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we saw it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and made manifest to us. Three times in that one sentence, he says it was made manifest to us. I saw it. I heard it. I touched it. He could have even said, I tasted it. It's his story. It's God's plan becomes St. John's story. And it's the one weapon, it's the one piece of content, if you will, that the world can't argue with without calling you a liar, which I guess is possible. Because when you get into an evangelistic conversation with somebody, when you just share your story, what are they going to say? Like, no, that didn't happen to you? And they'll be like, well, yes, it did. I'm like, no, it didn't. Well, yes, it did, you know? <laughs> it's, it's the thing that, like, it's, it's, it's awesome. Because and then instead of saying, like, I know this is true because I dirt, 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 It's like, I know this is true because Jesus loves me. And how do I know that he loves me? Because he's shown himself to me. And how do I know that? Because of this is what's happened. Know your story. Equip your people to know their story. I mean, just think for a second if the Diocese of Lansing was just full of the stories of God's movement. Remember what um, number two was with why we don't do it? We've never seen it work. Well, if we started sharing our stories, maybe people would see it work. Okay, so that's number two tip. Number three, you're going to love this one. Fast. We need to fast. And the bishop loves this. He's been calling us to this. I haven't done it every time, bishop, but like some of the time, okay. Um, whew, good to get that off my chest. <clears throat> we need to fast. There's this really dramatic moment in the Gospels where Jesus brings together, he sends out 70 you know, and I've often wondered, where did those 70 come from? Because we hear about the 12, and we hear about the three within the 12, Peter, James, and John, but where did those 70 come from? Fun fact, Jesus didn't just build a small group. He built an extended family on mission, didn't he? He had small group moments with the 12, and he had, like, intimate discipleship with the three, Peter, James, and John. But at the end of the day, he had, like, a, a family with him, men and women, an extended family-sized unit on mission with him. So those are the 70. But anyway, he sends out the 70, and he gives them all these directions. And, and then they come back and um, they debrief. You know? They're like, it was amazing. Sometimes we casted out demons and different things happened. And then they're like, you know, and sometimes it didn't work. What was that about? And he says something really interesting. He says, certain spirits can only be cast out through what? Prayer and fasting. I really believe that the spirit of the age that we're up against, the spirit of this self-determinist, narcissist, kind of secularism that we're up against, this, that spirit that is infested, especially the younger generations, is one of those types of spirits that can only be cast out through real prayer and real fasting. I only saw my dad take one sip of alcohol my entire life. It was at my wedding. He lost a bet to my brother. Um, and uh, because he'd given up alcohol for my brother and I, for our purity, for our chastity. And both of us were virgins on our wedding night. I also only saw him eat chocolate probably, I don't know, maybe like five times. Because he gave up chocolate for his marriage. 
39 years of faithful marriage. Fasting's hard. Nobody's like, gets up in the morning, you're like, you know what I want to do? Fast. <laughs> like, I can't wait, you know? Nobody, nobody feels that way. But it works, friends. It really does. And I would highly encourage you to think about as teams and as parishes, what are, what are the corporate ways that we're going to fast together for the salvation of souls in our area? Okay? So that's number three. Number four. Ask the Lord to give you heartbreak. Heartbreak. It's a dangerous prayer, but the Lord answers it. When you say, break my heart for what breaks yours, the Lord sees that. And one of the things the Lord does is he's looking over the face of the earth and he's saying, where are my people that are willing to be wounded with a wound of love for those who do not know me? There's a story in um, a book that you've probably read many times in the Bible, uh, Nehemiah. Yeah, that's actual book in the Bible, friends. Yeah. <laughs> and Nehemiah is is the, the Israelites are in exile, right? And Nehemiah is the cupbearer of the king, which is kind of a nice job. He gets to sit next to the king, and, you know, when the king needs a drink, he hands him a drink, and it's great, but unless it's not, because if the king, like, you know, throws up after drinking it, Nehemiah, you know, like, that, it's, it's a precarious position. It's nice, but kind of precarious. There's a risk to it. And Nehemiah gets word that, the, that his people, the Israelites who haven't been in exile, who are back in Jerusalem, are being ravaged by all these different tribes because their walls have been torn down and the people have no protection. And it says, when Nehemiah heard this, he fasted, he wept, he sits in ash, uh, sackcloth and ashes, and he just sits in this heartbreak. He, he doesn't wallow in self-pity, but he allows a certain heartbreak of God to really break him. Because out of that heartbreak, audacity flows. Out of that heartbreak, a vision for mission emerges. One of the reasons we don't know where to go or who to go to or we don't feel compelled by it, it's because our hearts haven't been broken. Our, the Lord hasn't pierced us with what pierces him. And so Nehemiah goes to the king and he says, hey, uh, I need some men. I need some money. I need some time off. I need to go rebuild the walls of the people you conquered. I mean, like, what a ridiculous ask, you know? Not ridiculous when it comes from the heartbreak of God. The king says, how much time do you need? How many men do you need? Go do this thing. He goes back, he rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem, the people are protected, and he and Ezra bring the law back to the people. Incredible moment. Again, dream with me for a minute. What would it look like if everybody in this room went home and started to pray for God's heartbreak? The beautiful thing is it won't all be the same. My heart is broken for my generation. I'm not saying this to toot my own horn, but I have, I have actually wept. I have actually cried, real tears, for people in my generation who don't, do not know Jesus. I didn't go looking for that. I don't, I don't enjoy crying, okay? I'm not like, you know, it's fun to, to, to have that heartbreak, you know? Like, it's, it's fun to be wounded for the Lord. No, no, no. I, I didn't necessarily, like, desire that. What I desired was, Lord, if you want to send me, I know that only, the only way I'm going to be faithful to it and be persevering it is if you do something deep within me that looks a lot like heartbreak, okay? So embrace failure. Know your story. Fast. Heartbreak. And then finally, none of this is possible. None of this is going to happen. It's not even worth trying unless we are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Pope Paul VI said, there is no evangelization. There is no making of disciples without the Holy Spirit. He called the Holy Spirit the principal agent of evangelization. How many times have you thought, I don't know what to say, I don't know who to say it to, I don't have the courage to say it, and I don't know when to say it. Like, the resounding answer to that is like, yeah, that's the Holy Spirit's job. He inspires the heart of the listener, he gives us the words to speak, he gives us the motivation to speak it, and then he does the work when we cooperate. I've heard this said many times, like, get out of the way and let God work. Like, no. Get in the way, because wherever the Spirit's flowing, I want to get in. It's like one of those, like, uh, you know, uh, at resorts, those, like, lazy rivers. Like, if the, oh, the Spirit's leading, I, I just want, I want that inner tube, yo. I want to jump in that and float down the river with the Spirit, because wherever he's going, that's where I want to be. Through our baptism and confirmation, friends, we have the full power of God. We have, we've been called temples of the Holy Spirit, tabernacles of the Holy Spirit within us. 
And he's the one who equips. He's the one who brings the power. Listen to this story from Acts of the Apostles. Because Jesus promises something. Talk about the risk at the beginning. One of the things that Jesus promises his disciples is that we will be rejected. We will be rebuked. We will be brought before people and, and put on trial. We will be wounded. If it happened to him, it happens to us, right? Jesus prophesies this over his people. Like, this is going to happen to you. So Stephen experiences that pretty quickly. Stephen's brought before the Sanhedrin, the very men that condemned his master to death. And listen to what happens. I mean, Stephen, um, <laughs> Stephen doesn't hold back. Let's put it this way. Like, listen to what he says to them. He says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. That's like a biblical mic drop, right? I mean, that, that is a throwdown. Uncircumcised in heart and ears. I don't even know what he means by that, but that is like super intense, you know? So justifiably, they're not pleased with that phrase. Listen to this. When they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth against him. My three-year-old Zeke, um, he's, he's just kind of learning how to be mad. You know, when kids get to that point where they realize like, Anger is an emotion that I can control and kind of manipulate. And so every once in a while, he'll get mad at me and he'll like, Grr, you know, <laughs> and it's like super cute. You know, most of the time I have, I like my wife and I have do everything in us not to laugh at that moment. So it's really cute when a three-year-old grinds his teeth at you, right? Not grown men. When grown men are grinding their teeth at somebody, what that means is they have lost control. They are, they are seeing red, right? They are, they are angry. Listen to Stephen's response. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What happens in that moment? What does the Spirit do for Stephen? He sees the destination. He sees the value. His eyes are lifted from the risk to the glory that is to come. Instead of being focused on what, this might, ha what might happen to me, what they might say, what they might do, what I might lose, Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, gazes into heaven and sees glory. He sees his identity in Jesus and he sees his destiny. He sees where he's going. That's what the Holy Spirit does, friends. He elevates our gaze away from the things that could distract, away from the things that could, could tempt, away from the things that could slow us down and, and keep us stable and kind of keep us uh, restricted. And he breaks that and he shows us the Father and the Son. And when we see that way, when that is our vision, we're willing to be stoned. We're willing to do anything. We talk a lot in our parishes and in companies about having a vision. This is the vision. That Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. That Jesus is in glory. That Jesus has already won. That the King is on the move. That nothing happening on earth is outside of divine providence. That he's not intimidated. That he's not scared. He's not wondering. He's looking Jesus is searching for people who will respond to the spirit that he's poured out on the earth, that he won through the cross. He's looking for that. And he's saying, who's going to follow me? Who's going to respond to this vision? Who's going to receive the glory that is mine that I cannot wait to pour out on those who believe and love me? So friends, let's not leave here trapped by simply a good plan or even a good vision statement. We don't need a good vision statement. We need just new vision. And that can only come from the Holy Spirit. Amen?